Hello, my name is Savannah Richardson and I will be moderating the speaker panel today. This special event is the seventh of a series of webinars hosted by the Bell Foundation about the effect of school closures on pupils who use English as an additional language. While full or partial school closures can have a mitigating effect on the spread of coronavirus, they inevitably come at a cost. The impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are far reaching and are likely to impact children and young people in compulsory education for a long time to come. It is important, therefore, to consider their potential negative consequences so that these can be addressed or minimized where possible. Today's panel of speakers is here to discuss how the crisis is likely to impact the most disadvantaged pupils in the short and longer term, with a particular focus on EAL pupils. Today, we are pleased to have a distinguished panel of five speakers who will be speaking for about five minutes each. The session will then end with a closing statement from one of our speakers. I am delighted to introduce the panel. Professor Becky Francis, Chief Executive of the Education Endowment Foundation. Diana Sutton, Director of the Bell Foundation. Joe Hutchinson, Director for Social Mobility and Vulnerable Learners at the Education Policy Institute. Professor Steve Strand, Professor of Education at Oxford University. And Kim Baker, Learning and Teaching Consultant for Luton Local Authority. Our first speaker is Professor Becky Francis. Becky is Chief Executive of the Education Endowment Foundation, an independent charity and grant funder dedicated to breaking the link between family income and educational achievement. She was previously director of the UCL Institute of Education, which is ranked number one in the world for education in the international QS rankings. Her prior roles include Professor of Education and Social Justice at King's College London, Director of Education at the RCA, and standing advisor to the Parliamentary Education Select Committee. Becky's academic ex expertise and extensive publications center on social identities and inequalities in educational contexts. Becky, would you start us off with your thoughts on the impact of school closures on disadvantaged pupils? Thanks very much for that warm welcome, Savannah. And it's a real privilege to talk to you all uh, and to address this really important and timely topic. So the background here is that, of course, as we record uh, this video conference, and many schools across the world are closed, the majority of pupils in these education systems are out of school, though, of course, supported and taught in various ways. But nevertheless, it's likely that school closures will lead to slower rates of learning um, and perhaps to learning loss. And there's a likelihood that the negative impacts will be worse for pupils who are economically disadvantaged. And of course, we'll come on to the issue of English as an additional language, compounding that in a second. Schools are gradually reopening now, and that's taking place in many countries, but often that's been a slow and gradual process, and we're seeing that in the UK. And in many countries, including the UK, complete reopening will be beyond scope for quite some time, and it's still unpredictable uh, how long that period will continue. And we found ourselves globally quite ill-prepared in education in relation both to the health science regarding school closures and then the school reopening, and in relation to education science on remote learning. In relation to the notion of the attainment gap, in the UK and England in particular, between 2011 and 2019, we saw the, that gap somewhat narrowing over the period in both primary and secondary schooling. But school closures due to coronavirus are likely to reopen that gap. And our latest analysis, which is based on a systematic review of the literature on school closures, suggests that the gap at the end of primary schooling could widen anywhere between 11% and 75% over the gap uh, over the time of school closure compared to its present size. Now that analysis, of course, has some uh, caveats because the literature on school closure is based on summer learning loss. This is where the high quality research has been previously based. And of course, during the, pre the, the period of school closures, 
kids are learning, they are being supported by schools and by families. But there again, we might actually see the differentials actually growing because um, the uh, opportunities for uh, learning gain in this period are even more unequal than ever. There's inequality of access to tech, broadband supply and so forth. There is inequality of resources in the home and there's inequality in the ability of parents to support um, uh, 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 and their pupils, uh, uh, their, their, their children. So for all of these reasons, that gap is likely to be profound and to grow. And in relation to English as an additional language, we're likely to see intersectionality there between uh, language learning and of course, um, social disadvantage. Of course, there's also a group of uh, students with English as an additional language who are not uh, socially disadvantaged. But there again, we know that the level of English language proficiency is key to school performance. And we also know, of course, that it, the, the age at which uh, kids with EAL start their schooling in England is a strong predictor of how well they will do, indicating that learning lost during this time in, in a school and, and an English speaking context could lead to really uh, profound um, implications for them. So, I think that what we need to focus on is the progress of learning recovery. We need to be thinking about um, compensation when schools reopen, um, but we need to be thinking much longer term rather than thinking about one-off ways to improve. We need to be thinking about a program of evidence-based systemic and holistic support to support kids to catch up. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much to you, Becky. Our second speaker is Diana Sutton. Diana is founding director of the Bell Foundation, a charity which works to overcome exclusion through language education. Diana's current work includes working in partnership with leading universities on research, which the foundation then applies to policy and practice. Recent work includes the development of the award-winning assessment tool for assessing EAL learners with Cambridge University and King's College London. Diana has worked for over 30 years in UK and international charities and in different senior management, policy, public affairs and campaigning roles as head of policy and public affairs for the NSPCC and previously as head of Save the Children's Office in Brussels and was a trustee of the Children's Rights Alliance for England from 2006 to 2013. Diana, over to you on closures and EAL pupils. Thank you, Silvana. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the key risk area for EAL children of language learning and the recommendations to compensate. Firstly, who are disadvantaged EAL children? A pupil is classified as EAL if they speak another language at home, but this tells you very little about how well a child speaks English and means that the EAL cohort contains a very different and diverse group of students. An EAL child could be an advanced bilingual child of a French banker, a newly arrived refugee, or a child of migrant agricultural workers. So EAL children will have very different educational profiles, different proficiency levels in English, and will differ significantly in their ability to access the curriculum and attain at or above the national average. And some language groups attain significantly below the national average. Today's discussion will focus on the measures needed to support those who are disadvantaged with low incomes from particular language groups and who have low proficiency in English. Why is it important to focus on the impact of school closures on the attainment of this group? Well, a child who speaks English as an additional language has a double job to do, learning English and learning the subject at school. This means that in addition to the learning loss experienced by disadvantaged children, for EAL students, there will also be a language learning loss. 
Research has established that for EAL pupils, the link between proficiency in English and attainment is very clear. The more proficient in English you are, the greater your attainment will be. So if you're new to English or have developing competence in the language, you will significantly underperform. We know that early years support is crucial for all children, particularly those who are disadvantaged. And research shows how vital the early years are for a child who speaks English as an additional language, who will have started in an early year setting, potentially fluent in another language, but possibly with very limited English proficiency. Let's look at this in more detail. The majority of pupils in the early years foundation stage have low levels of proficiency in English. An analysis of the data set provided by local authorities in England showed that 70% of EAL children in reception are at early stages of acquiring English. So a, a child who is new to English will significantly underperform compared to their monolingual peers in the early years foundation stage profile, with only 34% achieving a good level of development compared to 72% of monolingual children. In the early years and primary, children with EAL who are still acquiring English will be significantly disadvantaged because with little or no exposure to English, these children will be less able to access the curriculum. However, positively, the evidence also shows that if well supported at this age of their education and development in the early years, this group of EAL children can catch up perform well and even outperform by key stage four. Let's look at the picture in relation to language loss for older children and those who would be taking exams. School closures mean that most EAL students will have been unable to develop their proficiency in English at the rate they would have had schools not closed, thereby delaying their ability to access the curriculum and to achieve. EAL pupils need a certain level of proficiency in English, both to comprehend the content of the lesson taught by the teacher and also to express their understanding and knowledge of that subject. The language input from peers, from teachers and other adults in the school and the explicit modelling of academic English experienced in the classroom are necessary for this group of pupils and indeed for all pupils. If EAL pupils are in families where parents themselves are still acquiring English, they will not have the vocabulary or linguistic skills in English to model the language the students will need for academic achievement. This may also be true for other disadvantaged households and will be particularly pronounced for disadvantaged households where the child and parents have English as an additional language. In exams, students need to express their subject content knowledge through the medium of English. An EAL student may understand the concept being tested, but lack the academic language to express their knowledge and understanding to an examiner. Ofqual has explicitly noted that teachers should consider the language development a student would have made and the impact that would have had on their ability to express subject knowledge in their guidance for teachers in 2020. What are our key recommendations? Firstly, assessment. Students will need to be able to robustly assess the EAL pupils' proficiency in English to understand both their proficiency and the impact of the loss of language learning from school closures. Formative assessment of proficiency in English will be necessary for teachers to develop appropriate support strategies for pupils with EAL to enable them to catch up with their monolingual peers and access learning. Whilst a number of other English speaking countries support their EAL students through assessing and measuring proficiency in English, England does not. The reintroduction of proficiency in English scales is recommended along with training and guidance to help teachers assess EAL students. Secondly, accelerated language support. For pupils impacted by school closures, targeting teaching to ensure Accelerated language development occurs alongside the curriculum should be embedded immediately in schools when they reopen. Support will be needed to recover the at least six months where students were out of school in addition to any current language support provision that the schools may provide. Students sitting exams in the autumn in 2020 or in, in 2021 will need explicit language support to enable them to catch up the lost language development in order to demonstrate their subject 
content knowledge in an examination. Finally, training. Supporting EAL pupils is frequently cited as an area of great need for teacher training. Teachers will need to receive training to build their skills and expertise in teaching approaches to support the accelerated language development needed for EAL pupils to catch up with other English speaking monolingual peers. So in conclusion, recognise that this is a group of learners that will be particularly disadvantaged by the closures. Provide language catch up support, training and assessment of proficiency in English and recognise that those in the early years and those about to take statutory exams will be particularly affected and that additional earlier year, early year support can have a significant impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And building on EAL, uh, our third speaker is Joe Hutchinson. Joe is Director for Social Mobility and Vulnerable Learners at the Education Policy Institute. She graduated from the London School of Economics with a Master's in Public and Economic Policy and completed her second year of postgraduate study at Columbia University in New York, where she specialized in education policy. Jo was a statistician at the Department for Education for 10 years, specializing in analysis and research of school outcomes to support policies, including behavior and attendance, floor standards and accountability, impact of multiple and early GCSE entry, attainment and HE entry gaps, and character education. Major projects Joe has led on include the development and launch of the Disadvantage Attainment Gap Index, a world first application of mean rank difference methodology to deliver standardized tracking of educational inequality across changing assessment measures, evidence for the London Mayor's Education Inquiry and international evidence for the National Curriculum Review. Over to you, Joe, on EAL facts from the pre-pandemic world and how they relate to now. Hello, I would like to talk to you about three facts that come from findings from a research project that we published at EPI into English as an additional language and attainment back in 2018. So the three main points that I'd like to discuss today and then link through to the current uh, situation with lockdown and the pandemic and school partial closures are as follows. Firstly, we found that there was a need for support for many children with English as an additional language in school, contrary to many popular perceptions that this group may be in some way advantaged at school. Secondly, we found that support practices vary, as, as can be seen from the differential results found in different regions of the country for children with English as an additional language. And thirdly, we found that the school funding system does not properly match need for these pupils. So taking these one by one, we're going to consider briefly how they relate to our current lockdown context. So starting with the support that's needed in school. In our research, we found that children who have arrived in school later, so after reception year in, in a school in England for the first time, um, this characteristic is strongly associated with lower attainment. In fact, it's very likely to be a proxy for low English language proficiency as discussed by Diana already. So to give you an example of what this looks like, in 2016, the average grade at GCSE uh, for a, a pupil with English as an additional language, if they had arrived in or before year seven, was a grade five. However, for those who had arrived between years eight and 10, this dropped to a grade four on average. And for those who had arrived in year 11, the average was just under a grade three. So you can see there a clear gradient in attainment outcomes according to the time of arrival, resulting in a need for support at school for late arrivals with EAL in particular. How might this relate to the current context? Well, 
we know that there are concerns about learning loss experienced by all children, all groups of children currently, as well as concerns about rising inequalities between different groups of children. Particularly relevant in this case, as discussed by Diana, is also the loss of English immersion within school. Uh, when we think about schooling as a, a physical attending experience within a school, within a community, lots of speaking and listening and lots of discussion going on alongside the content learning, um, the potential loss of this immersion in the English language could be a particular disadvantage for children with EAL. Also, there may be language barriers to accessing remote learning, which we'll come back to shortly. So moving to the second of our findings from 2018, we know that support practices vary because we can see regional variation in the size of the gap that we observe for children who arrive later uh, within schools in England for the first time. Specifically, we see a clear north-south divide in the attainment for late arrivals. Whereas regionally, looking at other EAL pupils who'd arrived earlier or always been, always lived in England, there was much, much less variation than there is regionally for those later arriving pupils. So we know that support varies across the country. Linked to this and in the current context, we also know that remote learning varies across several dimensions from place to place and school to school. We know that the quantity, quality and the media used in remote learning differ from place to place according to the decisions made by individual schools and the resources that they have. So in some places worksheets are used, in others it's more focused on online tasks or online lessons or sometimes broadcast lessons. A key feature which would differ across these different media through which remote learning is taking place would be how much interaction there is between children and other children learning and between children and teachers. Clearly some of those forms of work are more potentially interactive than others and that would affect how much speaking and listening practice children with EAL have and how much that helps to develop their language. So thirdly, the final finding I want to discuss today was around the school funding system and how that accommodates the needs of children with EAL. We found in our research that the funding system as it's currently set up does not match need. In particular, the EAL factor that's paid in respect of children with EAL to schools as part of their school funding under the national funding formula is currently paid for up to three years. But this is very different from what research tells us about what's needed. The research consistently indicates a range of five to eight years uh, as the period of time it takes for children with low proficiency to reach an, a level of academic proficiency that enables them to engage in a secondary school curriculum, for example. A second aspect of this looking at the funding reforms that have taken place for schools over recent years under the national funding formula. This formula introduced and brought about relative funding shifts away from areas that are ethnically diverse, urban and disadvantaged. And we found in our analysis, looking at the funding that follows the typical EAL pupil as an overall package from the whole of the funding formula, that these shifts especially affected primary school children with English as an additional language, who saw a relative reduction in the funding per child. So thinking about how this links to the current context, as schools respond to the lockdown and to reopening, they are still affected by the funding distribution and, and the way that the formula works as they attempt to put in place support for children with EAL. But also, as mentioned previously, the resources available at home will vary too. So some of the important factors that might be at play, particularly for children with English and additional language, and especially at the more socioeconomically disadvantaged end of the scale, 
include having enough space to work quietly, particularly for families with more than one child in school. Sometimes the home environment doesn't allow enough space for children to be able to work quietly on their work uh, separately from their siblings and also from parents who may be working from home. There's also an issue related to the family risk from the virus itself. Emerging evidence is suggesting that people from black and minority ethnic communities face an increased risk of catching the virus and suffering serious effects from it, which changes the chances that children may be in families affected traumatically by the virus itself and potentially by bereavement. There are also differences in access to internet connections and sufficient devices for all members of the family to take part in learning or work. And finally, differences in the parental support available and whether parents are able to engage, for example, with worksheets that are printed with English instructions. So those are the three factors that, we, that I wanted to discuss today to think about the impact of our research findings and how that might be playing out in the current lockdown context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jo. Our next speaker is Professor Steve Strand. Steve is Professor of Education at the University of Oxford. He holds a first class BA Honours and PhD in Psychology. His research interests are in the associations of ethnicity, social class and gender with a wide range of educational outcomes at all stages of schooling. He has almost 100 scholarly publications in the field, including international peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters and research reports. He has been an advisor to the Department for Education and Special Advisor to the House of Commons Education Select Committee. Steve, over to you on the estimated GCSE A-level grades process. Silvana, thank you. Uh, I want to talk today about a very specific issue, which is the impact of the school closures on the award of GCSE and A-level grades uh, in summer 2020. Um, I'm going to talk most specifically about the GCSE grades, but the general principles apply equally to the award of A-level grades for this summer. So those of you who work in school will know that we're talking about a two-stage process. Uh, in the first stage, teachers are going to be asked, um, using their detailed knowledge of the individual students, to estimate for each pupil the grade they would achieve um, and their rank order, which essentially is going to be how secure you feel uh, that prediction is. So if you are awarding 10 grade Bs um, in geography, you might rank first a student who you're absolutely certain has got um, a very high probability of getting a B and you might rank 10th, the one where you think it's a more borderline case. Now I think um, most people um, in education are happy that teachers actually are the people who are most well informed about the whole context surrounding uh, individual pupil and are most able to make um, a good judgment about the grades that those students would have been likely to achieve. Certainly, although we are a data rich nation, we don't hold anything in central databases that could uh, match that depth of knowledge that teachers will have had uh, or have about the students that they teach. Nevertheless, we also know that the process of awarding grades and estimating um, what grades would be given um, is uh, open to certain challenges. So we know historically, for example, that when teachers um, are asked to make estimates about A-level grades for the purpose of ACUS and university entrance, although those grades that are estimated do tend to match the achieved grades in about 50% of cases, 
in around about 15% of cases, those grades are underestimated, but in about 35% of cases, those teacher grades are overestimated. So there is a tendency to overestimate those levels of achievement. Um, so there's going to be an important second stage to the awarding, which is a centre standardisation. So essentially this is going to ask the question, are, is the distribution of grades that is awarded by a school that which might reasonably be, be expected? Or are, are there variations? Uh, are, the, are some schools maybe being more lenient uh, and some schools being more severe in their grading? And the main mechanism to generate that expectation about what might be reasonably expected is going to be the key stage two prior achievement of the cohort that would have sat their exams in 2020. Uh, in the case of GCSEs, it would be GCSEs for those who are going to sit A levels in 2020. I'll stick to the, the key stage four or GCSE outcomes. Now that's reasonable, I think, if there's a single predictor um, you would choose to use, prior attainment is going to be the best single predictor that you could possibly select of all the uh, range of predictors that are available. But there are issues if you only look at prior attainment, um, which is the current um, position of Ofcom. Um, and that will be uh, impacting on EAL pupils in at least two ways. One is that key stage two results will tend to systematically underestimate the GCSE predictions of pupils who had the low proficiency in English. So if we look at last year's Progress 8 scores from 2019, the mean Progress 8 score for EAL pupils was 0.48. That is, um, EAL pupils tended to achieve half a grade higher in each GCSE they took than would have been predicted from their attainment at Key Stage 2. So any grade distribution that's estimated only on prior attainment will underestimate um, the likely levels uh, that, that might be uh, achieved by a school um, with a high proportion of EAL pupils. Now one of the things that we know is that actually that EAL um, average is going to be quite misleading because we know that there's a very strong relationship between your proficiency in English um, and your outcomes and actually some EAL pupils in fact uh, a vast majority um, at uh, key stage two um, some work I did with uh, um, in 2018 um, shows that 25 percent of pupils uh, at key stage two are acquiring English in terms of their proficiency in English and they're at the lower three stages of the skills that were used briefly within England and those are the young people that can be particularly impacted. Those who are um, EAL but are developing competence um, are going to be uh, more negatively impacted but those who are competent or in fact fully fluent will be less impacted. However we don't have proficiency in English because it's been um, the, the government ceased to collect that data so we have to do something that uh, uses the EAL flag. The second issue will be those estimating the great distribution for schools where there's missing key stage two data. Clearly if you don't have prior attainment data, um, that's gonna be a big issue. I think that's probably the largest problem there is gonna be independent schools who don't take key stage two results. That's gonna be a very, very big issue. Um, but later arriving schools with a high proportion of late arriving EAL pupils um, will also be impacted because uh, as we heard from Joe, uh, the achievement um, um, differences are, are, are very strong depending on um, if, you, if you don't have key stage two, you didn't uh, uh, work in an English school then and you arrived more recently, that tends to be associated with low proficiency. Um, so in those contexts with missing key stage two data, it's going to be very important to look at uh, the school's previous results and to model, say, a three year previous average to have a better indication of um, what the outcome might be. So in thinking about this, Ofcore has indeed um, been taking a lot of advice and has an expert advisory group, but I think there is an important thing to estimate here, which is that they should, in order to get the most accurate estimate of what the grade distribution might reasonably be expected to be for a school, employ a contextual value-added model, or rather than just looking at prior attainment, they take into account also um, all the other information that is held and can be modelled separately um, from the National Pupil Database. So we are talking about EAL as a key in interest here, but also entitlement to a free school meal, gender, special educational needs and all the other um, 
information that's available. And that's really important to do because we must make sure that the predictions are as secure as they can be and as accurate as they can be. And that's important to be fair, not only to AL pupils, but actually to schools with very few AL pupils and a high, high proportion, um, say for young people and free school meals. So it's really important that we try and make the predictions as um, accurate as we can do. There are also ways of refining that model. Um, one could in fact look at what the average contextual value added for a centre or a school has been over the last three years. So some schools do tend to achieve better outcomes than might be expected given their uh, prior attainment and the context of their pupils, others less so. And we could actually look at tweaking models uh, to take into account some of the historical value added. So it's important that these um, factors are all considered uh, by off quality in the process of setting the standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Our fifth and final speaker is Kim Baker. Kim is a learning and teaching consultant for Luton Local Authority and has an interest in EAL learners across all key stages. Kim has a BA from Goldsmiths College London and an MA from King's College London in Language, Ethnicity and Education. She has over 25 years of teaching experience in primary and middle schools, mainly as an EAL practitioner. She began working with the Bell Foundation in 2015 when the Language for Results program was being developed and is an active Bell Foundation licensed practitioner working with colleagues in local schools. In recent years, Kim has also had an interest in elective home education. Over to you, Kim, on the response of schools and the local authority in Luton. Hello. Um, thank you, Silvana, for that. Um, what I want to start with is to say that we've heard a lot about the uh, negative impact on pupils with EAL. However, schools are very inventive and I want to talk about some ways in which they're meeting the challenge. Ultimately, they know their pupils well and a huge effort has been made across Luton to ensure that pupils are in contact with their teachers. The response of Luton schools has been evolving as the various pieces of guidance have been received from uh, various places. Phase one was preparing for lockdown and involved a huge challenge. Um, much effort was put into supporting families, finding food banks and making sure that those in receipt of free school meals had vouchers. Um, schools had to be quite inventive and they, they produced their own voucher systems until the Department for Education system uh, got over the teething problems. Work was set for pupils to take home. Uh, many schools had packs of work uh, with reading books, stationary supplies. Over the Easter holiday, a local charity was able to supply additional resources of paper and crayons to identified families. I'm not sure in the initial work that went out with, with children at home, how much differentiation there was uh, in places specifically for EAL learners. I know that some schools uh, were able to uh, send out uh, websites, lists of websites to parents, uh, especially those new to, ed to English, um, with simple vocabulary, with rhymes, videos, this sort of thing. But I'm not sure uh, how much advice went with that and how to use those effectively. Few schools were able to offer online learning. Our high schools were better placed, uh, uh, but a few primary schools offered a digital approach to home learning from the start. During lockdown, um, school staff have been contacting families by phone, uh, usually weekly, but for some families that's been daily. Um, they've been texting, using parent mail, sending out newsletters. Uh, there has been some use of first language in this, uh, where personnel have been able to communicate in community languages. But obviously this is um, a possibility for every language that we have in every school. More schools are gradually building up their digital, digital lesson delivery and there are uh, they're also developing ways of monitoring the engagement in home learning for pupils. 
this has been a challenge because the response has been very varied. Uh, however, we've seen an increased engagement from primary schools in online training for teachers and their skills are improving. As highlighted by previous speakers, we realise that te the technology divide is especially acute for some families with EAL learners. Many schools have risen to this challenge by repurposing old IT equipment for families with no access to tablets, laptops or other devices. Schools are also fun funding dongles to allow internet access to families who have got no bro broadband. This is still an area we are trying to develop solutions for. It's an ongoing piece of work. We have a well-established head teachers strategic group that liaises across the borough. It's now meeting weekly and the heads are able to share experiences from their neighbourhoods. And this has been an effective forum for sharing information about successes. Other communications from the local authority with head teachers have been about developing their return and recovery plans. Uh, each school has a named LA person who can point head teachers to experts to help them with any queries that they may have. They act as a sort of sounding board about, poss about the possible return to school plans. By the week beginning the 15th of June, we hope that 96% of our schools will be opened to the named year groups. There's still a high state of anxiety amongst families uh, about a second spike of COVID-19 infection, particularly families with a BAME background. This information has been gathered by our um, BAME listening project led by one of our uh, multi-academy trusts. Leaders in each community co collected information about their community's concerns. I have to say though that I do feel that all our schools are carrying out robust risk assessments and taking advice from the Department of Education, qualified health, safety, health and safety experts, Public Health England and Public Health Luton to inform their return and recovery plans. Wider opening decisions are being made by individual schools in a bespoke way and within that the makeup of the school's community is a key consideration in their risk assessments. Individual schools are in communication with parents and at the moment parents have the final say as to whether or not their children will return to school when invited. We're aware that those pupils who have returned to school are probably coming from families who may have been less directly impacted by COVID-19. A bigger challenge will come once the return to school becomes compulsory and more cautious or anxious families have to send their children to school. With this in mind, there's, there is and there will be a great emphasis on the well-being of pupils when they return helping children to build their resilience once again, making sure that learning routines are reinforced before beginning interventions to catch up, um, emphasising that a school is a place of safety. In conjunction with our NHS colleagues, we are encouraging schools to ensure that all staff have um, undertaken trauma training so that pupils can be appropriately supported uh, uh, over adverse childhood experiences. Um, we've commissioned bespoke IT support for primary teachers and we're very aware that the access to digital learning as I said before is an area that many families are, are struggling with so we, we haven't forgotten that. Uh, we've got transition projects in place for all phases and we're working on a new venture with the University of Bedford where they're going to facilitate some sort of ESOL uh, support for students transitioning into um, the sixth form. So schools are beginning to think ahead uh, about new staff that are coming in September. They are beginning to divert devise induction sessions um, to 
make sure that all teachers are aware of the additional needs that EAL pupils have after a long prolonged absence from school and uh, they know what strategies should be used. Practitioners have expressed concerns about how to assess gaps in their learners, uh, EAL learners, and um, how to address the gaps and how to make up the loss that they may have. We will be having online meetings to share uh, good practice across the borough. So as I said at the beginning, ultimately schools do know their pupils and a huge effort has been made and continues to be made across Luton to ensure that pupils are in contact with their teachers. Some learning is happening. So for every challenge we identify, I hope you can see that we're working with colleagues to actively seek solutions and, I, uh, and, and share them as widely as we possibly can once we find any. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, uh, for being our final speaker and closing on a very positive and hopeful note. We do know that all the practitioners are under huge amounts of pressure. So thank you very much. So we had a range of speakers um, looking at the impact of school closures uh, from different angles, from policy, from research, from practice on the ground. And it's time for concluding thoughts from Diana Sutton. Diana, over to you. Thank you. Well, we heard a number of different perspectives this afternoon, um, particularly how currently support varies substantially across regions um, from some areas where there is a few areas where there's still local authority support, but um, other areas where there's very limited support. We've heard about funding in the system doesn't match the need that the three years funding in a system but that it actually takes between five to eight years to achieve academic proficiency. All presenters have underlined the importance of assessment and assessing pupils proficiency in English. We've heard about the challenges for remote learning for all pupils but particularly for um, pupils who are disadvantaged who don't have access to technology um, and for pupils who, for whom English is an additional language, where the um, instructions may be in English. There is obviously a current issue for late arrivals. Very striking was Joe Hutchinson's slide um, showing that if you arrive between year eight and 10 in the system, your average is actually a grade four. We heard in, in detail from Steve about the challenges with the current system of exam assessment or assessment in the absence of exams, I should say. Uh, the, the tendency now for there to be an overestimate, the tendency um, for the key stage two results to underestimate EAL GSE scores. Um, we also heard a very specific recommendation from Professor Strand about the need for a contextual value added model um, to make sure that predictions are as accurate as they can be. We heard some very practical steps from, from Kim Baker in Luton about what families um, and uh, local authorities are actually doing to help families and um, pupils to learn during lockdown and as schools gradually go back. We've heard the particular issue for BAME families who are more vulnerable to COVID. And we mustn't forget that amongst those families, there will be a substantial proportion of EAL learners. We heard about specific recommendations about the importance of language support and support post um, COVID and as we exit lockdown. Um, a word of caution really, that we don't know how long we will be managing um, school tuition in this sort of partial lockdown as some schools go back as some year groups go back uh, we even read at the weekend that exams may be interrupted some way into the future so uh, a particular um, highlight is really thinking about what needs to be put in place for EAL learners disadvantaged EAL learners if this situation is to continue into the future as opposed to 
the immediacy of the here and now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And thanks to each of the speakers for agreeing to be on the panel and for sharing your insights so generally, generously with us. I'm going to round up now, but before I close this session, I just wanted to remind you that we are planning a follow-up question and answer webinar to this event where the, the audience can post questions to the speakers. Further details will be available on the Bell Foundation website soon. Our next webinar for practitioners will be on Thursday, the 18th of June, and it will be on developing effective induction programs for EAL pupils. Check the Bell Foundation website for this and hope you can join us. Once again, thank you very much, Becky, Diana, Joe, Steve and Kim for giving us your time and sharing key insights with us. We will stop recording now. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye from me. <laughs>